I was writing for my own pleasure. It wasn't till I had kids that I started to tell them stories and then write some of them down. If you have the patient as a grown-up, it can be really a, a great way into figuring out what your kid sees and what they're, what they're noticing on a page and how the story might change for them every time they're looking at it. So yes. you grew up in Toronto, you spent your summers in Stratford, you got this all this artistic uh, immersion, uh, so to speak. But what did you decide to do, um, you know, in high school or after? What, what was your path? Uh, did you automatically oh, want to become a writer or what did you imagine yourself doing? <laughs> no, I didn't even finish high school. I'm a high school dropout, which teachers love when I say that to their classes full of kids <laughs> on school visits. Um, and I, so I never had any higher learning. I'm pretty self-taught. I moved to New York, actually. I, well, not immediately. I dropped, I left school. I worked as an usher at the St. Lawrence Center in Toronto and just lived in a, moved out of my parents' house, lived in a room. And I had actually spent my 10th grade year, my father was on sabbatical that year, and I had spent that year at boarding school in England. And so I had made some friends. I was exactly the age, 14, to not travel around Europe with my parents, but to, you know, have this adventure of my own. And I came back from that with very close friends. And one of them lived in New York City. And I moved when I was... 21 to New York City to get an apartment with this one friend and that's how it all started. We lived in the East Village and we had I lived I ended up living in New York for 30 years. Wow. So <laughs> with, you know, time off and back and forth, but um So when did you put pen to paper and and or maybe did the illustrations come first? When did you start jotting things down? When did you think that that was something you could do? I didn't start writing until I was about 40. Wow. I had many jobs in New York City, and I eventually started my own little toy design company, and that led to some illustrations. It wasn't until I had kids that I started to tell them stories and then write some of them down, and then eventually I... <clears throat> My first book was called The Invisible Day, and it was about a kid in New York City who finds a makeup kit that turns, you know, the powder in the kit makes her invisible, and so she um, has wonderful adventures very safely in New York because she's invisible. So there's that's actually a trilogy, and those are my first novels, and therefore sort of eight to ten year olds. And where were your kids uh, age wise at that time? Were they your first audience? Yeah, they were my first audience, for sure. They, I guess, Hannah was probably, my older one, it was probably about 10 or 11 when I was writing the book. A lot of people sort of fancy themselves as writers, and it's a very big challenge to get things published. So were you one of those people who's writing for your own pleasure, and then suddenly someone picks it up and says, oh, this is amazing? How did that go from page to uh, the market? I was writing for my own pleasure, but then I, I met someone who was taking a class at the new school, so I went and took a course to make my book better, and then I joined a writing group, and then one day, and I, so I had sort of written the first book in this very patchwork help from a friend or figuring stuff out for myself. I had started to read this age you know, early middle grade books for my own <clears throat> daughter. So that's, uh, I was in the right mentality. But then I, one day in the playground, I was chatting with a dad. Our kids were, you know, playing at our feet, basically. And he said, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer. I don't know how I had the nerve to say that. But he said, I'm an agent. And <laughs> And then he said, okay, you can say, I didn't even ask, but he was like, send me what you're working on. And I did. And he phoned me back the next day and he said, wow, turns out you can write. He was clearly dreading so much, you know, just having to read some shite by, um, yeah. <laughs> by a person in the playground. But, and he's still my agent 
So that's, that's incredible. Yeah. So um, that worked out really well. And and where did the, did the illustrations come out of necessity that you needed to do illustrations for the book, or did you always have an artistic? I didn't. I pen? didn't illustrate that first book. Okay. It's done in pen drawings by Abby Carter, who was you know just an illustrator hired by the publishing company. Right. Um, and <clears throat> I didn't illustrate until my first picture book, which was only a year or two after that. But um, yeah, the first one, the agent sent it. It got accepted. And that was the beginning. Now, you've ri- written books for different ages, and, and I know you've also done books that don't have any words. That I guess you call them board books. So uh, give us a perspective on how you write a book with, with only pictures and symbols and things like that that have no words. How, how do you construct a story? I read them all the time to my, when my children were young, and it's sort of like, how do they get that idea to do that? I know. It's really a challenge for the grown-ups because they have to actually have a conversation about yeah. <laughs> the book. But for the kid, it's, I mean, if you have the patient as a grown-up, it can be really a, a great way into figuring out what your kid sees and what they're what they're noticing on a page and how the story might change for them every time they're looking at it, depending on, you know, if they're six months or eight months or two and a half. Um, Most of the board books that I've done have been so-called concept books. A concept book is different from a story book. Story has a story, obviously, and a concept is, you know, opposites or, or counting or something that that isn't really a story. Um, my most recent board books have been based on the idea of, for instance, a single piece of string, and the string becomes something different on every page, or a red button. And in one, you know, in one page, a red button is a stoplight. In another, it's a cherry on an ice cream. In another, it's a tail light on a car. And so, th- it's almost a look and find, but. Um, there's not really a story. There's just a, oh, 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 look at the world a little differently. When we as adults read books, we read them and put them aside and move on to the next book. But what is it about a child's imagination that wants them to reread and read this again, read this again? They, they never get tired of the same story twice. What is it about what you've learned as a, as a, I guess you're an educator in many ways, but what have you learned about childhood development that leads to that, where they, oh, I want to read that again and again and again. Well, I think the first time, of course, that you read a book or that a child reads a book, it's exciting and they want to know what happens. But then they almost always, as you say, they go back and start it all over again because now they know. Now they feel there's some power. They know. They're smart enough. They have... they. They can see how the story is turning out, and they really like to pick it apart and to see, oh, she's doing this now, and she does it again later, and I already know that. And there, there's a real comfort in, in being savvy and being wise to, to what goes on. And it's also the first time through, the second time through, you're still wor- learning the words, or there's a sense of... You know, if there had been a new word, or there's a scene that was especially funny, and you just, they, it's really something that they love to do over and over again. And what age does that end, and we start reading books once? What do you think the cutoff point is? I think for women, <laughs> it carries on to a certain extent forever. Men are less rereaders, I think, than women, but I think... There are, and that may be a generalization based on nothing, maybe just because the readers I know are more female than male. But um, I think we all have comfort reads, so called comfort reads. People talk a lot about rereading their favorite, Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. I read Emma every year, or whatever people are in love with. Certainly, Agatha Christie, despite it being a mystery. People forget <laughs> who the murderer was, or even when they know, they come back to the same. There's a love of the same characters and getting to really know the characters. Mm-hmm. 